Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Mormon Kabbalah Podcast. Still in chapter 23, if you remember last week, we went over the right eye, wisdom, hakma, and it was interesting because it stated in verse 5 that the second and third sephirot is hakma, wisdom, the beginning of the path before the creation. And as we mentioned last time, in verse 9, which is what we'll be starting with this week, it says, the second and third eye is da'at, knowledge, the truth of the way before the creation. Now, this is where Mormon Kabbalah and traditional or Jewish Kabbalah and Christian Kabbalah and Hermetic Kabbalah and all these other Kabbalahs, this is where we're really going to begin to, we already went our own way in a sense, when rather than focusing on the Sephirot as the emanations of God alone, we remembered the first chapter of Genesis, which states that we were created in the image of God. And therefore, these emanations don't merely describe the Lord, they also describe us as the creation because we are that mirrored reflection of the creator, of God. So the next big change here is that the top of the left-hand column, and we've talked about this already a little bit in a previous podcast, in traditional and most other forms of Kabbalah, the top sephirot on the left-hand side is Bina, not Da'at. But in Mormon Kabbalah, it is Da'at. So what is Da'at? What is Bina? I'm not going to get into Bina too much, except to say that Bina, and and we'll talk about this more later, Bina is intuitive understanding or complexion. In traditional Kabbalah, it's likened into a a palace of mirrors. And, And that is kind of similar to our view in Mormon Kabbalah, except that rather than mirroring the point of light on Hakma, it mirrors the light coming from Keter because it's understanding. And we also need to understand that this for Mormon Kabbalah, is the masculine side of the tree of life. And Bina is a feminine noun, but Hakma is also a feminine noun. And so it makes sense for that feminine noun to be on the right-hand column on the tree of life, because that's the feminine column in Mormon Kabbalah. But how can both the right and the left, representing masculine and feminine, both be topped by feminine nouns. That doesn't really make sense. Now, what's interesting about Da'at, it can also be pronounced Da'ath, by the way, is that while it is also a feminine noun, it's also used as a masculine term in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 10, Proverbs 14, 6, and possibly even in Job 33, verse 3. So we have this idea in the scriptures of da'at being masculine, knowledge being masculine. In a sense, it could be feminine because it is the tree, which is feminine, of knowledge of good and evil. But the fact that this can be masculine, to me, is a sign that we're on the right track here. Now, understanding that da'at is the hidden sephirot in Jewish mysticism, in Jewish Kabbalah, and and most other Kabbalistic schools of thought. It falls beneath Bina and Hakma and above Gevura and Hesed. I want to look at Da'at from this traditional point of view, just traditional perspective, but I want you to understand that we're looking at it as the hidden Sephirot first. Because it's hidden, it's not always seen or represented on every picture of the tree of life as a part of the Sephirot. It's usually just an empty slot where four Sephirots meet. And in some traditions, there's this idea that Dot isn't even a Sephirot at all, but rather it's all the Sephirot united as one, which to me, I don't know, to me, that's what the tree of life itself is. In Mormon Kabbalah, the tree of life is its own sephirot, and so I don't personally see it that way. But the idea here is that this sense of knowledge 
is a spiritual state that we can receive through gaining access to the emanations of God. This idea of knowledge is a hidden unconscious power of the intellectual mind. Now, I don't want to get into this too much here because I want to talk about Da'at more in the Mormon Kabbalistic point of view and get into these kind of concepts with understanding instead. Now, I will say that in the book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 4, we read, And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. And in traditional Kabbalah, this is the idea that the chambers of our hearts, the emotional soul, will be filled by da'at, by these, by this hidden knowledge. And so then there's this idea of da'at being this divine light. And I, I don't think that that's wrong for the Sephirot position, the hidden Sephirot. I just don't think it fits because knowledge is something that you can have, but understanding is something that you earn through practical experience. Now, you can say that you gain wisdom and you gain knowledge through your experiences. But to me, knowledge is something that can be defined. I know this. I know that. And likewise, wisdom is something that can be expressed. I have experienced these things and gained wisdom. And when you put them together, you have understanding. But I don't feel like you can put understanding and wisdom together to have knowledge. And so for me, it just doesn't fit. Now, I do want to say that I have a bias here. The first time I saw the Tree of Life, I was really studying it after the Lord asked me to unite his people in Kabbalah. When I first really started studying the Tree of Life, and I think I've mentioned this before, the Lord told me, no, Da'at needs to go up there where Bina is. Bina needs to go down here where Da'at is. And so you could argue that the reason why this makes sense to me is because I've been trying to figure out why. At the same time, I've tried to sit and understand this from the traditional Kabbalistic perspective, and it, it just doesn't work for me unless the ultimate goal is to receive knowledge and not understanding. And so this is a divide in my mind between the purpose of traditional Kabbalah, and that here would include the other branches of Kabbalah, Christian Kabbalah and Hermetic Kabbalah, from Mormon Kabbalah. I don't believe that we're here to gain knowledge. If we came from the Creator, then we have knowledge. It's just a matter of unlocking that knowledge that we've had being eternal beings that have coexisted with God forever. What we don't have is understanding, and I feel like that's what we were sent here to gain. To take that knowledge and wisdom and gain practical experience. Now, that said, I do want to quickly point out that I have talked to some traditional Kabbalists who would argue that everything I'm saying is completely moot because understanding and knowledge are the same thing. And so, therefore, you can say that Da'at is the hidden Sephirot or that Bina is the hidden Sephirot, and it really doesn't matter. So, if you are a more traditional Kabbalist in any of the various other schools of thought, please don't think that what we're going to talk about going forward won't make sense for your journey, because I believe it still will. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into chapter 33 of the Book of Remembrance. In verse 9, I'm going to read it again. The second and the third is the at knowledge. Now again, this to me is important because it is the top of the left pillar. So if you are climbing up that left pillar, when you get to the top, you have knowledge. Whereas when you climb to the top of the right-hand pillar, you're going to get wisdom. And so when you put these two together, wisdom and knowledge, you have the right and the left eyes. And they are both two and three. And so therefore, the divine masculine and the divine feminine are equal. 
you get a greater perspective when you combine wisdom and knowledge or the right and the left eyes. And wisdom is the beginning of the path before creation and knowledge is the truth of the way before creation. What does that mean? Well, we've already discussed this idea of the beginning of the path. Once you begin to take the things in your life and learn from them, you begin to become wise. And so therefore, that's the wisdom of the path, right? Because I have seen, because I have felt the Holy Spirit, I believe that God is real. And therefore, I have this wisdom. At the same time, though, you could go straight from Keter down to Da'at because with this wisdom, we have accepted the truth of the way. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know I have a knowledge of the reality of God. This is how we see as Christians the wisdom of the reality of God and the knowledge of God's reality. And I think that we have to understand this first. These two things belong together, like chocolate and peanut butter. I love Reese's Cups. I don't know if you remember, if you're old enough to remember the old commercials where two people run into each other. Oh, you got chocolate in my peanut butter. You got peanut butter in my chocolate. That's how I see these two Sephiroth. They just go together perfectly. And if you only have one or the other, you only have the masculine or you only have the feminine. And remember, I'm talking about inside of ourselves. If you only have one or another, you can't properly exist. Because if you only have knowledge, the masculine represents the desire to bestow. And you just keep giving and giving and giving and giving until there's nothing else left. But altruism is the truth of the way. So we must give. But there's a balance. The feminine, as we've talked about before, represents the desire to receive. But again, if we just take and take and take and take and take and take and take, we can never have enough. But together, we have give and take, right? That's what life is about. Give and take. The knowledge that life is about give and take and the wisdom to know when to give and when to take. That's the balance. And when you balance these together, you can see properly through both eyes. And it says in verse 10 that only by knowledge may wisdom be gained. So this flips the script. It says that wisdom is first, but this is saying that wisdom can't be gained without knowledge because the beginning of knowledge is truth. I can know that my car will run on water, but if I put water in the tank, it's going to destroy my car. And so it's a false knowledge. We have to have true knowledge and true wisdom in order to move forward in this path that is the Sephiroth. And as the creations of God, we have both emanating out from us. When we accept the light of Jesus Christ, the Book of Mormon calls it the light of Christ, we have the wisdom to see the truth and the knowledge of what that truth is. And so because of that, it unlocks something inside of us that allows us, you can call it being born again, you can call it the pierced heart, but it allows us to become a vessel so that the light of God can flow out from us. And so that's why I say that the Sephiroth aren't merely the emanations of God. They are the emanations of God shining out into the creation, into the world through us, because we are the creation of God, and we're made in God's image. Knowledge is the left eye. From truth came the Torah, the treasure of heaven. Now, what is the Torah? I know a lot of people like to translate Torah as law, and I will tell you that when translating the plates of brass, 
the word Torah came up quite a bit, especially in Third Moses and beyond. And I was translating as law, even though that's not what it said on the little piece of semi-transparent parchment above the plates. What it said was Torah. And I was like, oh, well, that means a law, 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 law. And then I was asking the Lord at a certain point, is this correct? And the Lord asked why I changed it. I said, oh, well, because it says Torah. And we know, everyone knows that Torah is the law. So therefore it's law. And he said, well, if it's the law, why didn't I put law? Because there are times when the Lord has a Hebrew word there. And there's times when there's several different English words that I can choose from. And there's times when there's just one word and that's the word the Lord wants me to use. And so I went and I looked it up. Torah doesn't just mean the law. It means the teachings. It means the instructions. So I went back and I fixed my error and I replaced the word law with what the Lord originally told me to put in the first place, Torah. And that means for me, that means that understanding the term Torah is critical. Truth doesn't come from the law. Truth comes from the Torah. It comes from the teachings. It comes from the instructions of God. And the teachings are the instructions. And the instructions are the law. But I don't see this as a law like we have human laws. If you walk across the street in the wrong place, you can get a ticket. If you park in the wrong place, you can get a ticket. If you do something bad, you can get arrested because you broke the law. No. When it talks about this idea of the Torah as the law, I believe that that means it's the truth. I believe it's a law like gravity is a law. And so what is the Torah? It's love. Everything that's in the Torah teaches us to love. Why don't we murder? Because we love our neighbor. Why would we want to hurt them? We don't commit apostasy or adultery. Why? Because we love the Lord and we love our spouses. And therefore, we keep our covenants with both. We don't steal. Why? Because we trust the Lord to give us what we need and we don't want to harm someone else by taking what belongs to them. I can keep going. Every law in the Torah or every rule or law as we as human beings see in the Torah, they're not laws like that. They're instructions, they're teachings to help us understand the true law. Love God, love your neighbor. Jesus said that those two are the most important and that all the law, all of the Torah and the prophet are based on those. Why? Because when we have true Christ-like altruism, we have true wisdom and true knowledge and can see the world as it is through our open eyes. And therefore, it is only through this knowledge that wisdom can be gained because we know the truth of the Torah. And what is the Torah? The treasure of heaven. And what does Jesus say in the Lord's Prayer? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the Torah. That the love of God will permeate here in the creation just as it does in the heavens. Verse 12, And I, the great Jehovah, am its herald, but in my place stands Kamel to be its herald, and Kamel walked the earth as Alma until I took him. Now that's a Book of Mormon reference. But who is Kamel? Let's, let's find out. Now remember, I understand these angelic names to be saying something about us, how, how we're supposed to be in and as we become our true selves, what attributes should we have based on these sephirots? So when we look at the word Kamel or Hamel, it means one who seeks God. And here's the interesting thing. 
What's this angel known for? It's, he's an angel of peace. The angel of peaceful relationships. Some believe that his purpose is to teach us humanity of God's unconditional love. That is true knowledge. Now, I do want to point out that this angel is not mentioned in the scriptures. He's not mentioned in any Latter-day Saint scriptures beyond the revelations I've had that I'm aware of. He is definitely not in the Bible or Book of Mormon by name, but there is a tradition in Judaism and Christianity that he was the angel that comforted Adam and Eve after they are sent out of the garden. In traditional Kabbalah, he is one of the seven archangels that has the honor of living directly in God's presence. But what I find the most interesting is this idea that he is Alma. And to be clear, in the Brighamite tradition, I was taught to say Alma, and then his son is Alma the Younger. This would be Alma the Younger, the one who has the mystical experience after fighting against the church, an angel comes to him and the sons of Messiah. He's also the one who disappears and was taken in a similar way to Moses, where he just wanders off and no one ever finds him again. And it does say here that he walked the earth as Alma until I, the Lord, took him. Now, some scholars believe that Alma means youth or lad. In Hebrew, the word traditionally translated to Alma, it means a young woman, usually an unmarried woman. Now, because of modern archaeology in the last, what, 30 years, 40 years, something like that, we have found that Alma was used as a male name, but we don't really know exactly what it means. Some people have suggested it can mean lad of God, or he is bound to God, but we, we don't really know what this name means, unfortunately. But I do like this idea of it referring to belonging to God and being tied to the archangel's name, one who seeks God or he who seeks God. And so I kind of have like this idea of you put those two together and it's seek God in your youth. We should seek God all the days of our life. Don't wait till you're older. Start seeking right now. I don't, I just really like that idea. If you have some other ideas of what it could mean and what it, that verse is trying to say, I'd love to hear from you. But that's, that's where I'm at on that. So looking at these together, that is to say the right and left eyes together, we have this healer who is wisdom this peace, this king of peace, who is wisdom, looking at Raphael and Melchizedek. And we really can see a right and a left eye here. If you want to get a true perspective, seek God, seek the healing of God, seek the truth of God, seek the peace of God. And this is how we're supposed to see the world. And it's the light of Christ that should be flooding the world from us. We are the, the candle set upon a hill, not hidden under a bushel. And so as that light flows from us to heal the creation, these two sephirot work in harmony and bring balance to one another and balance to us. And so I would encourage you, as you're pondering these things, to see how these two sephirot fit together and work together. We're going to do the same thing with Hesed and Gevura and see how those two work together. And then we'll put the four of them together and unlock the hidden Sephirot as we are exploring this tree of life. So I hope you found this helpful. And if you have, I would like to encourage you to please like, if you're on YouTube, like this video. If you're listening to a podcast or you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. And we will continue our journey, climbing the tree of life, looking at the Sephirot through the perspective of Mormon Kabbalah again next week. So until then, Shalom and God bless.